Hello and welcome to Sage Advice, tips for self-advocacy group advisors. This is a part of our Stay Healthy at Home webinar series. And as always, if you have any questions or comments, feedback, you can type that in the questions box and we will see it. Uh, if we do not get to respond to your question during the webinar, we will respond within 24 hours. And then if you look a little bit lower on your control panel, you'll see a handouts tab, and we do have some handouts for you to take today, including the slides of this webinar. We will have a poll and we will have some case examples that we will work on at the end of our webinar. So if you want to include feedback or comments for those case examples, again, you would just put them in the questions box. So a little bit about us and our program. My name is Erin Smithers. I'm the Information Referral Coordinator with the New Jersey Self-Advocacy Project, and I'm joined with Ashley Ritchie. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here for another installment of our Stay Healthy at Home webinar series. My name is Ashley Ritchie and I am the director of the New Jersey Self-Advocacy Project, which is a division funded program of the ARC of New Jersey. We work with the state's largest network of individual self-advocates and self-advocacy groups, also known as the New Jersey Statewide Self-Advocacy Network. So Erin and I and Frankie Bayak, our media and uh, communications coordinator, develop trainings and resources for self-advocates, agency staff, and of course, direct support professionals. So we're really excited you're here today um, because we have a lot to discuss. So let's check that out. So yeah, I'm hoping that you guys are here to hear about everything that goes into creating a uh, effective, self-advocacy group. We're going to talk about the roles and responsibilities of our advisors, our group advisors. And as Erin said, we have some case examples to illustrate um, common themes and issues that might come up or you might uh, encounter as a self-advocacy group advisor. I want to make it very clear. We are uh, open to advisors of all experience levels. So we love new advisors, seasoned advisors. We're just happy that you're here. Uh, we are going to share some tips and techniques that we have developed in our collective 20 plus years of experience advising self-advocacy groups. And again, like Erin said, we really hope that you participate in the interactive features of this webinar, which are, you know, the polls that are going to happen and our questions box to respond to the case examples. So firstly, we want to be able to help as much as possible. So we're just curious. We're gonna start a poll asking how you identify. If you are an experienced group advisor, if you're a new group advisor, you're looking to start a group. If you're a current group officer or a member of a group, or if you selected other, just let us know what that is in the questions box. We have 20% say experienced group advisor, and we have 40% say a new advisor looking to start a group, 20% are a member or a group officer, and then 20% say other. Interesting. All right. And as Erin said, you know, if you want to let us know who you are, how you identify, there is the questions tab on your GoToWebinar control panel. You can write in there and uh, send it to all of us and let us know. So let's check out uh, kind of a brief history of self-advocacy and where self-advocacy, the movement, originated. So the origin of self-advocacy uh, is based in Sweden, Sweden. So. In the late 1960s, this doctor, right over here on our on the right side of our screen, he was the director of uh, the Swedish Association for Persons with, at that time, MR or Persons with Developmental Disabilities. Uh, he worked with people with and without disabilities to organize a type of club. The club didn't have any uh, elected officials or leaders, and the rules were simple. Members were supposed to go out into the community 
and then meet up afterwards to talk about their different experiences as people with disabilities in the community and people without disabilities in the community. Because at that time, uh, institutionalization was happening. There were state hospitals where people with disabilities were living versus group homes and supervised apartments as we know them today. So the doctor's idea was to provide people with developmental disabilities with these normal life experiences in the community. Uh, sometimes that involved a level of personal risk. So club members that didn't have disabilities, uh, they were actually college students, they were expected to help facilitate those opportunities for the club members with disabilities. So people were expected to make their own decisions, even if some mistakes were made along the way. And the program was pretty radical at that time because again, people with disabilities were living in institutional settings and in congregate settings. So uh, most professionals and parents didn't have the views that we you know, hold today that people with disabilities have the same rights as anybody else and have the right to make these mistakes and make choices. So uh, this doctor, Dr. Nirja, actually you know, disagreed with all of this and wanted to see every person be allowed to have experiences and be allowed to fail, be allowed to make mistakes. That's part of being an adult. Um, so let's check out the next slide here. This is a quote from a paper that the doctor wrote. So he kind of viewed this level of advocacy between community members with disabilities and without disabilities working together just to be in the community as kind of a revolution. So uh, this is a quote from the paper that he wrote on this, this process. Some of the adults themselves definitely want to play a new role in society. So they wanted to create a new image of themselves in their own eyes, in the eyes of their parents and in the eyes of the general public. And this struggle for respect and independence is always the normal way to gain personal dignity and a sense of liberty and equality. I will say, you know, this was written back in the 60s in 1969, um, but I think this really is relevant today. Self-advocacy is about revolution. It's about changing people's minds, educating people about issues of importance to folks with developmental disabilities, and bringing the voice of people with disabilities to the forefront, not speaking on behalf of, but facilitating that message. Okay, so let's dig a little bit more into how self-advocacy spread, um, be, how self-advocacy spread from Sweden to the rest of the world. Because self-advocacy is a worldwide civil rights movement led for and by people with disabilities. So we know we, it started here, uh, the orange spot on the map, that's Sweden, it hopped over to the UK. So from the United Kingdom, it jumped across the Atlantic over to Canada. And in Canada, one of the uh, first conferences, self-advocacy conferences was held in British Columbia in the 70s. This coincided with the deinstitutionalization movement so people with developmental disabilities moving out of large congregate hospitals, institutions, those large state-run settings and into the community. So uh, the Canadian conference happened, self-advocates, folks with disabilities on the West Coast got word. And the first self-advocacy conference was held in the United States in the 80s. So by 1995, there were more than 600 advocacy organizations throughout the country, including the national organization known as Self Advocates Becoming Empowered, SABE. And here in New Jersey, we have uh, thousands of self advocates that are involved in the movement. So over the course of this time period, it's been an explosive growth. And I will also say that you know every self advocacy group is different, but certainly some of the issues that we were hearing about in Sweden back in the 60s, wanting to be accepted in the community, wanting our parents to see us as adults capable of making our own decisions. Those are still some issues that we're addressing today. So um, we are going to move on now and talk about some of the basic tenets or basic principles of the self-advocacy movement. So from the start, as I said, it was about community inclusion. It was about people with disabilities being able to go out into their communities, try different things, 
talk with peers who didn't have disabilities and learn. It was also about making decisions and making mistakes and learning from those mistakes. Real work for real pay, it continues to be um, a driving principle behind self-advocacy. Self-advocates certainly want support staff to be paid a living wage. But on the flip side of that, we also hear from self-advocates working in um, places where subminimum wage is the norm. We hear, hey, I want to get paid a living wage too. Um, so that is a big part of the advocacy movement, making sure that people with disabilities are viewed as professionals um, and paid for what the work that they are doing on par with their peers that don't have disabilities. Empowerment is a piece of the self-advocacy movement because again, we are advisors. So we are taking our cues from the membership. There should be no uh, view as, of advisors as the teachers in the room or the, the parents or the bosses. Self-advocates are the bosses of self-advocacy meetings. I wanna just say uh, one thing about person-first language. So person-first language is a big part of self-advocacy. It asks that everybody view people as people first, disability diagnosis, you know, last. Some people identify as having a disability and find that uh, part of their identity that they're proud of. And uh, that's wonderful. It's a natural part of human life. Um, but it may not be somebody's entire identity. So identifying someone by their name, by their preferred uh, name and how they want to identify is important. In the autism community, person first language may not be the preference, but by and large, um, the self advocates that we support um, do enjoy person first language. And then also self advocacy is about learning together. So I'm learning from the folks that uh, in the groups that I advise, just as I like to think that they are learning from the information I'm bringing to the group. And I think this graphic on the lower right hand side of the slide, work with me, not on me, do with me, not for me, that about sums it up. So that was created by a wonderful organization called Open Future Learning. And this is what we want. We want collaborative work, not let me just do for the group because you know, I think that'll be easier or quicker. It's about learning together and doing together. So we're gonna talk now a little bit more about the specific role of the advisor and how you put these theories, these philosophies of do with us, not for us, um, and nothing with, about us without us. How do we put that into effect? So we are talking about true collaboration. Um, let's start with our goals. Every group has goals, whether it's a group of professionals in marketing or advertising or medicine, every group has goals. Why are we getting together? What is the purpose of this? What's gonna keep me coming back? It's the same deal with self-advocacy groups. So goal setting should be number one priority. And it's not what I, as the advisor, want to learn about and talk about. It's about the members. You need buy-in from your membership in order for to make sure people are going to keep coming back to your meeting. So right off the bat, it's important to know. Um, usually, I put a huge post-it on the wall, and we start talking. I think it's about relationship building. As an advisor, I need to know who's in my group, who's in the group that I'm going to work with. And from there, you can kind of create a timeline for working on your goals and keeping a, an, a very organized agenda is one way to do that. An agenda literally just uh, is, should be defined as our to-do list for the meeting. It's what we're going to work on together. So it's collaboration between uh, what we're going to work on, who we're going to reach out to, the different fundraisers we might be aware of, the awareness campaigns we may start and implement. And one other thing I want to note about language is that, um, you know, it's important to be aware as an advisor, as a professional in the field, language matters. So the way that we talk about someone is going to reflect how we treat them. So it's important to avoid infantilizing language like 
you know, my guys and my group and, you know, anything like that. You just keep in mind that you're working with a group of adults and every person has an entire life that they've lived that they're bringing to that group. And that can be such an amazing strength and benefit for the group. Um, people who are drawn to advocacy typically want to use their experiences, whether they're positive or negative, to do work and to advocate on behalf of other people in their community. Everyone can play that role. It's just about finding out who fits where, where matching people with their strengths. Um, so yeah, I think we're gonna get a, into a little bit more about the actual responsibilities of our group advisors now, the how-tos. So some of the physical responsibilities that you have are to gather members. I put some stuff on the screen that we're gonna go through that I use in all of the meetings that I advise. So we do have flyers you'll see on the left that we use in our uh, council meetings. They're given out at each meeting uh, pre-pandemic. It was you know, physical paper copies uh, during our virtual meetings and during the pandemic, everything's virtual. So they're PDF copies. Um, we would put the calendar on the back so that way all of the information for the meeting is on one page. So they can just hand that out and everybody knows when the meeting is, what the meeting is, uh, what time it is, where it is. And our contact information is also on there. So in case they had any questions, they could reach out to us. Another responsibility is actually organizing the calendar. We like to organize it for the whole year. Typically, we like to have it all set and ready by the October meeting. So that way you have two months to make sure people are aware of when the January or February meeting is. Um, people need time to prepare transportation and get their schedule ready. So if it's done by October, it's usually enough time for everybody to uh, be prepared for the next year. I would just reach out to locations and schedule the meetings, making sure that the location is available. Some of the free places that we meet, uh, so money isn't coming out of dues or anyone's pocket, are could be in a hospital, uh, meeting rooms and coffee shops. Some of the Starbucks by me have a separate meeting room with a door, so it's private. Uh, libraries, municipal buildings, uh, basically somewhere where uh, it's local to the members of the group so that it's more Sorry. accessible for okay. people to attend and also so that, um, again, it's free. Those are always the best options. Some groups cater to a larger area and they rotate locations to be more accessible. It is gonna be more consistent and more convenient if the meeting is in one location. But again, some places are uh, a larger area where the members are coming from. So rotating the meetings could be an option as well. Advisors might also be responsible for sending out reminders for the meeting. And I'm gonna go a little bit into, this is how our email reminders look reminders look like. I have a short greeting up at the top. I put in bold when the meeting is. So for this email, it was that night. Uh, so I would put tonight in all caps with the date and the time. And this is also the subject for my email. So council to the date and the time, uh, sometimes not the time, but definitely the date. I wanna have the information available no matter where they're looking. So if they're scrolling through their emails, they still see the date. If they're in the email, they can find the date and the time. Then I have like a short little blurb here about how to join. You can join on a laptop, a tablet, or a smartphone, or you can call in. And then I always add this sentence, uh, just, um, I always include the calendar. Sometimes if the agenda is ready, you know, that's in there. Sometimes if it's not ready, I don't put that in there, but I will always have the calendar. And then I just ask everyone to print it out. Then for the details of the meeting, I put all of that in red so that it really stands out. If you've ever had a Zoom uh, invitation that you sent to someone, you know, it's pretty long. It has a lot of different phone numbers. It has a lot of different links and it can be kind of confusing. You're not sure which link to use or which phone number to use. So I kind of just simplified it. I just say click here at, you know, the time of when the meeting starts to join the meeting and I have the link. And then I have a few spaces and if someone wants to join manually, they can do that by going to this link 
And I don't have this as a hyperlink um, because I want people to just be able to type it in if they want, or you can click on this and it'll take you right to the website. And then they can enter in the meeting ID and the password. So sometimes when you copy the meeting ID, there isn't spaces in between the numbers. And I like to include that. It just makes it a little bit easier to read. And then for people who call in, uh, which you can still do with Zoom, I just picked one phone number. It gives you a list, but I picked the one that's valid for our location. I picked New York, and then I only include that one phone number so that it's not too confusing. People know exactly what phone number to call. And then again, I give them the meeting ID and password. Even though it's just right up here, I like to keep it all together so that no matter how they're joining, all the information is together. And then again, I just have those spaces in there just to make it a little bit easier to read. And then underneath that, sometimes I include this, sometimes I don't, but I have like a little blurb about um, our program and our information. Big fan of hyperlinks. So uh, instead of having all these links all over the place, I just like to have it as, you know, whatever it is. So check out our website, click on the word website, takes you to our website. Over here, click on our Instagram page, Facebook page, Twitter page. So it's just a lot easier to read. Um, it's less confusing and there isn't links everywhere, especially when you want someone to click on a link for a meeting. Um, I make that one just a link so that people can immediately recognize it. Everything else is a hyperlink. So that way it's not as confusing. They know exactly which link to click for the meeting. Then I have my signature, again, with more hyperlinks. And I have our calendar, which again, like I said, I always, always include, no matter what, it's in there, no matter what the message is, if it's a meeting reminder, if it's a recap, if it's uh, something pertaining uh, to something completely separate, but it's for the group, I will still put the calendar in there. Um, it doesn't you know, cost anything to print it out for me to hand it out. So just throwing it in is an easy way to be reliable and consistent and still get that information out. Uh, you never know who needs it. And our flyer for our calendar is very easy to read. It has the dates, has the time right here because that's consistent, that's always the same. And then it has my information. So my information is in this email twice. Um, they have my email, they have my actual information here, they have my information in the signature, and they know how to get a hold of me. And then if the agenda is ready, I will include that as well. Sometimes I try to uh, do the agenda as early as possible, but sometimes there are things going on that I need to wait to happen. So I have the details. Um, so for this particular meeting, we had um, you know, a meeting on March 2nd. Sometimes there's a meeting going on that's a little later in the month, and I'll wait until that meeting happens so I can include information about it in the agenda, um, especially if it's something that, you know, we were asked to talk about or something that I need specific details on. Sometimes meetings don't happen. So if it didn't happen, obviously I'm not going to put it in the agenda. So as soon as the agenda is ready, I will put it in. And again, it's a PDF, so you can include hyperlinks. So I have, we do current uh, positive events every month. And then I have the link for the Zoom here which is really nice. No matter what, our Zoom link does not change, our meeting ID does not change, and our passcode does not change. So if someone loses the information from this month, they can go back and look at previous agendas, they can go back and look at previous reminders, and still any link from any reminder I've ever sent will get them to our meeting, which I think is really um, the best way to do it. You want people to be able to read you, and sometimes mistakes happen. Sometimes emails get deleted. Sometimes, you know, agendas get deleted. So uh, no matter what email they're clicking on, if it's for this meeting, the link will work. And that is what my email reminders 
look like. And it's so easy. You can just copy it from month to month. You want to keep the emails up to date. Um, so sometimes emails go out of, I don't know, they just stop working. Sometimes people leave. Sometimes people get a new email. So you want to make sure your email list is up to date. And other than that, you can just copy this information since it never changes. Pop that in your new reminder and you're good to go. I also want to add, um, you'll see on the right hand side here, we send out no less than four reminders a month. We send out a monthly reminder. Uh, in some groups, we send out a reminder every week. We send out a reminder the Monday before the meeting and then we send out a reminder the day of the meeting. Uh, the more reminders you send out, the more opportunities people have to get the information and attend. And again, we work with people who might accidentally delete something or have a hard time finding the information. So the more you send it, it's just the more opportunities people have to join. So back to some other physical responsibilities that you have. The advisor should also work with the members to set goals for the year. Ashley talked about how important that is for the meeting. So I like to include it in the agenda every month so we can work on it. People can add ideas to how to achieve those goals and just see our progress. Our group also votes to collect dues. Not all groups do, but part of that responsibility for the advisor is holding onto the money, making sure that it gets deposited into the account in a timely manner. We don't want to be holding onto that money. Uh, creating and handing out receipts. Some people who pay dues have to have that receipt. Keeping track of the in and outs of the money with financial reports. There should be 100% full transparency about this money. So anyone should be able to know how much the group has, if any was spent, which is something that the group would vote on. It's not something that I just make a decision for. It's not my money. And how much was collected at the meeting. So we do have um, a financial report we include in all the agendas, and then we also discuss in detail at our advisory board meetings. Oh, I'm sorry. We also work on fundraisers, which you'll see on the right, and events and elections. So all of these start with a vote. For fundraisers, the group talks about their options. Then we vote on which one we want to do together. Events are planned the same way. All members uh, vote on, you know, the things that they want to do, how they want to spend money. We finalize the, the plans and then everything is voted on. For the elections, we take time to make sure potential officers can campaign provide an opportunity to help with speeches, and if they wish, make sure that everyone is completely aware of what the position entails. So we are always willing to do officer trainings anytime. For each meeting, we also make sure that we have these specific items on hand, an attendance sheet for the secretary, the code of conduct, and a contact sheet for family, staff, or people who provide transportation. These are typically kept in a binder for the secretary to keep track of um, their minutes and then also to hold on to any flyers that are passed out as well. Some secretaries take audio notes, some use pen and paper, some use pictures, whatever supports the officers need, we provide. In any meeting, I make sure that we have the resources prepped and ready to go. For virtual meetings, that means I pull up any trainings, flyers, web pages that are going to be viewed during the meeting. I have them open and ready to go. So time is not spent trying to log into things or find things. For in person meetings, I would have all of my paperwork and flyers ready to be handed out or grabbed by members on their way into the meeting. When meetings were in person, this meant I had to go a little earlier to set up before members arrived. Sometimes tables and chairs need to be moved around. Sometimes it's just the paperwork that needs to be set up. However, I always like to be ready before the meeting starts. I'm also available on the day of the meeting to help people get on or get to the meeting. I might be getting phone calls or emails from people who can't attend. This also might take some further activity on my part if it's one of the officers who can't make it and their role has to be filled by someone else. I would have to make sure the other officers are prepared to take on that responsibility. And then for our meetings, we also work with officers and members to create an agenda. Some groups have an agenda, some groups don't. Some are a few sentences, some have more detailed agendas. This is how we typically make ours. Each council is a little bit different, but they have similar outlines. 
This agenda works really well for our groups and helps keep everyone on track since we usually have a lot to talk about. Some of our meetings are uh, one and a half to two hours long, and some of our meetings are very large. So when you have a larger group, a detailed agenda can really help people follow along. At the top, we have our header, which would include the name of the meeting and the date, could also include the program name or the location. Then we have regular topics that we discuss at every meeting. If there were any guest speakers, I would add them to the agenda after this, um, after the, the regular topics. Typically, they don't stay for the whole meeting. Um, they wanna come, give their training or talk what they wanna talk about. And so sometimes we might skip the welcome and introductions um, or uh, skip the code of conduct treasurer report and then go right to the guest speakers and then go back to the regular topics just to give the speaker enough time to make sure they can talk about everything. Um, we also don't wanna keep them waiting around. They might be very busy. Like we typically sometimes have um, governmental uh, Congress people, as assembly men and women attend our meetings or the uh, New Jersey ombudsman who comes and they're very busy. Uh, they're carving out time for our meetings. So we wanna make sure they're able to talk about what they can to talk about. Then we have old business. This uh, could be items that we talked about at the last meeting. It could be items that we just wanna keep an eye on or it could be things that we're kind of working on a little bit every month and then new business, obviously anything new for this meeting. Some meetings discuss current events. Some of our groups opted for positive current events to kind of end the meeting on a lighter note uh, that was big over the pandemic. Um, a lot of people felt that they were reading and hearing a lot of negativity in the news. So they wanted to start including a positive current event instead of a regular current event. Then we conclude with our reports, open discussions, and announcements. These we always do every meeting. The chairperson does an extra report, maybe something they wanted to address, something from another meeting, something they saw in the news. Sometimes they don't have anything to report, and that's fine, but this time is reserved for them. Then the advisor has that time reserved for them as well in a field report. We end with announcements, birthdays, open discussion. And we found when this is on the agenda, people are more likely to stay on topic if they know they have that free time at the end to discuss their personal news or share something. Then I always, always end the agenda with the information for the next meeting, the date, the location. And then since our meetings are virtual right now, I stick that link in there for the next Zoom meeting, which is the same for each council. So council three's link doesn't change, council two's link doesn't change, etc. There are also some behaviors that advisors should adhere to as well. So you want to be clear and concise. You should always try to be clear with your communication. Sometimes euphemisms and metaphors can be confusing or mean different things to different people. Also, I'm finding, depending on your age, some people might not have heard of your metaphor or euphemism before, and they will have no idea what you mean. So it's best to be precise with your words. Make sure everyone understands what you're saying. Have people maybe acknowledge that they received the information or paraphrase something back if it's important. This should also apply to explaining your boundaries, especially with phone calls, and emails instead of saying something like i'm always available for you that to someone might mean that if they call you at 10 pm they expect you to answer you can instead just let someone know what your working hours are um, i work eight to three i work nine to five if you email me or call me during that time i will you know get back to you or i'll get back to you that week let people know that uh if you're not working, you're not gonna be able to respond and you'll get back to them as soon as you are back at work. You also wanna provide open and honest communication. Let people know that you're providing a safe space. That way it'll help everyone feel comfortable enough to ask questions or bring up tough topics. Um, 
just provide a place for people to talk about their personal issues with advocacy that can be one of the hardest thing people are speaking up about things that they're going through and if they're not comfortable they might not want to so make sure uh, making sure you're being honest with your communication sets the tone for the rest of the members be consistent and reliable this is just so super important my reminders are consistent. My contact information is consistent. If someone calls, I respond. If someone reaches out, I respond. If someone emails me, I respond during working hours. I'm reliable and this lets people know that I'm here if anyone needs support. It also helps people feel more comfortable communicating since they know how to reach me and they know that I'm open and honest. And then of course, just be friendly. It's just a part of acting professional, using appropriate body language and providing a safe space at the meetings. It again sets a tone of what is expected from the members and why it's important to read that code of conduct at every meeting. Bullying, rude behavior, put downs are not tolerated. Everyone present at the meeting is expected to adhere to these rules, whether it's the members, the staff, family, or the advisor. Communicating in advance is also really, really important. If there's a change in plan, if uh, someone from another staff is going to be participating or being a guest speaker, or you're not able to make it and someone else is taking over, just let people know. Some programs plan their transportation or staff schedule over a month or two in advance. So as soon as you have information about the meeting or if something's changing, you really just wanna get that information out to everybody. This also goes for if you're planning an event as well. The more time you give people to register, the better. If you feel that it is too early to get details of the event together, then send out a save the date flyer. This can ensure people have time to find transportation or support staff so that they can attend without knowing the little details of the event. Okay, so this is all crucial information and i really just want to echo what aaron you know was saying that it this is meant to be a collaborative process so true collaboration means you know i'm using the skills and resources that i have to benefit the great ideas and goals and vision that the members have so when we were talking before about collaborative goal setting it's not about me to bring a set of goals to the group. It's about utilizing shared experiences to create what that group is going to do. So as an example, I was working with a group for several years um, before we kind of all realized that uh, all of the members had experienced bullying at some time uh, in their lives, specifically in school. So you know, it came up a lot, you know, it came up talking about those experiences, talking about feeling other than and uh, less than. And the members were basically like, you know, that really was an unfortunate experience. And we started to look into like bullying is a huge problem for members of the community. What can we do to address it? So we opted to make a slideshow presentation and we started pitching it to schools. And we were, you know, long story short, we were able to present to an entire school um, about that experience, how to identify bullying, how to stop it, resources if you're experiencing bullying, and basically just the message of, you know, there are self-advocates speaking before you as professionals and things get better. And here's how self-advocacy can help. So again, from like a negative experience that was shared by everybody, we turned it into something that the group, uh, one of the goals, which is community awareness and community education. So you might find that with your group as well. Again, collaborative de agenda development, meaning I'm not the one coming up with the agenda. It's, that's not me, that's not it. It's about working together on creating a vision for the group and pu putting that in writing. So that may mean I'm talking to a self-advocate maybe a leader in the group over the phone or over email and i'm transcribing those ideas into a format you know that aaron showed you guys it's simple it should be concise and it could, should be written in a way that anybody 
whether they're familiar with your group or not, can pick up that agenda and have an idea about what the group stands for. Same thing with dues collection, saving and spending. It's not up to me. Don't thank me for the nice polo shirts that you guys got embroidered for your presentation at the school. That is a group decision. So when we you know, have these ideas, there's no wrong answer. You know, there's a part of every meeting where we try to leave it open to brainstorming and creative ideas for where the group can go. Um, sometimes this happens organically. Someone will just say, oh man, I was having a tough time with, you know, this, or uh, I really want to know more about guardianship and what my options are. Okay, let's, you know, look into a guest speaker on the topic together. Um, so yeah, again, above all else, I think self-advocacy groups are about collaboration and an advisor has to be comfortable with that. Um, I'm not the boss. It needs to be a, a fully, an experience that's really led by the self-advocates involved. All right, so let's check out some tips for being prepared for our meetings. The gavel. So this was part of every self-advocacy meeting up until we went virtual. Um, the groups that we support do have a position called sergeant at arms. So it sounds very official, it sounds very serious, um, and it is. This person is the one who is going to step in if there's crosstalk. This is the self-advocate who's not afraid to bang that gavel and say, we need to get back to the agenda. It shouldn't be me. In other words, I'm not the one banging the gavel. That's an elected position within the group, and it fits somebody's skill set somebody who's not afraid of bringing some order to what could otherwise be maybe a disordered process. Um, same with dues collection. There's a strength there, someone who's comfortable moving around the room or um, you know, interfacing with the members and collecting their dues. Typically, the, I say the most common number for dues is like a dollar a meeting. We've seen more, we've seen less. Um, but again, this is this depends on a lot of different factors. Can members hold cash on their own? Are there limitations to that? Um, is there a safe place where this money can be stored? And would you as a group prefer to hold off on monthly dues collections and instead focus on annual or biannual fundraisers instead? Again, group decision. And when we're looking at our calendar of events, so this is not based on my schedule. This is based on what works best for the group. So we want to make sure that that is, again, a discussion. If everybody works until five o'clock, don't have the meeting at 2.30. Um, if everybody lives in, you know, the central region of the county, don't have it at the northernmost tip of the county. We want to make sure we're sharing in the um, travel distance to the meeting when we get back to in-person meetings. Same thing with this calendar, as Erin said, have a copy on hand at every meeting. Don't assume that someone held on to the copy that you gave them back in January when you distributed the agenda of the calendars for the first time. Make sure you have that information ready to go in kind of your advisor go bag or go kit. Um, also, technology, right? So in my professional role as director of the project, I have access to some pieces of technology that the members might not be privy to. So I can use that to benefit the group. So if we have a guest speaker coming, I'm gonna bring my laptop and projector and ask them if they need anything else. I'm not going to just assume everybody has access to that technology, but if I do, use it to benefit the group. Um, so yeah, these are just some things to think about in terms of really being prepared for anything. That's part of the advisor's role for sure. Um, Aaron also talked about the contact list. I can't stress that enough. You need to have um, up-to-date contacts with every staff member, manager, group home supervisor. Um, you need to maintain that contact to ensure that the members can then get that information and be prepared for the meetings that are happening. Um, yeah, so I think we're gonna move on and talk a little bit more about expectations and boundaries. So yes, communicating expectations and accountability. You wanna make sure everybody knows their role. An advisor should also make sure that uh, it's not just the role that they know they have, but their responsibilities. If 
elected uh, officers know what their roles are and have the supports to perform them, the meeting runs smoother. The members can participate independently and hopefully over time without prompts and eventually we might be able to fade out. We do have a few tools to help do that with your meetings. So we have this handout. Again, it's in the handout section, so you can take that. Uh, we have two pam uh, pamphlets in there, two packets, I should say. One is resources about our program, and the other is resources you can use for your groups and your meetings. This just breaks down the different roles, the descriptions and duties for the officer positions that we hold in our meetings. Um, chairperson, vice chair, secretary, treasurer, sergeant at arms, and then our meetings also have an independent advocate. We also have on the right hand side just virtual meeting etiquette tips, looking professional, acting professional, and being informed. And then at the bottom, we make sure that all officers are aware of what meetings are mandatory. So for the New Jersey Statewide Self Advocacy Network, we have our council meetings every month and then the chair the vice chair and the independent advocate also attend our bi-monthly advisory board meetings so there's two meetings that those three positions are mandatory attendance the uh, secretary treasurer and sergeant arms just mandatory we ask that you come to the council meetings so if you have one meeting or four meetings that people need to be at make sure that everybody knows that and is aware of that and then we also hold officer trainings where we teach what the roles are and it's more interactive and I'm going to go through what we what we talk about in those. So this is just a short and quick training that we provide before elections. Sometimes we'll do it once at our advisory board meeting and then once at each of the councils. It all depends on who needs the training if it's all new people you know we'll definitely make sure that they're getting the information but it's basically just a run through of our bylaws um, the rules that we have to follow uh, with the New Jersey statewide self-advocacy network also a breakdown of the roles of the positions so we just want to make sure that everybody is aware of these bylaws. Uh, they do change, um, you know, from years to years. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody is aware of those changes. Some uh, of the changes might not be so new, but people just need a refresher. So we just like to go through, make sure everybody is clear on what is expected of them in these positions. So we just break down the election that has changed a few times uh, especially over the pandemic so we want to make sure everybody's comfortable and aware of the process to be elected and to participate in the election so sometimes it was held at the actual meeting sometimes it was held at our luncheon uh, sometimes it just changes the pandemic um, we uh, actually talk to everybody and we decide to just push it back a little. So just as long as everybody's on the same page, we wanna make sure everybody's prepared ahead of time and ready for the elections, especially since we do speeches and we have people present why they should you know, get votes, why they would be great for the position. Then we run down the code of conduct, which we, read at every meeting, uh, our AB meeting and our council meetings. Again, a code of conduct is just a set of rules that everybody follows at the meetings. The code of conduct uh, reminds people to be respectful, not interrupt everybody, uh, put cell phones away, um, just be uh, professional in the meetings and outside of the meetings and to just remember that you are holding a position that you are voted for, so you need to be held to these standards. We go over the attendance. Uh, in our particular meetings, uh, we have a certain amount of missed absences that are okay. Um, an abundance of those results in a forfeiture of the position, and that goes uh, for the AB meeting and for the council meetings as well. So we just like to make sure everybody is aware. If you're going to miss a meeting, 
we would like some notice ahead of time in case we have to prepare anything or uh, help someone else prepare for the meeting. Then we hold campaigns. So we talk about the campaigns, the importance of them, what you can do. No one is forced to speak in front of other people or participate in a campaign if they don't want to, but it's just something that's available if people would like to participate in that. And then we'd go over the terms, which have changed, um, you know, in, in the amount of years that we've been doing this. So we want to make sure everybody knows how long the term is, when the next election is, um, and then if you would like to end your term early, how you can go about doing that. And then also, if you're unsure if you're eligible to run, uh, just how to uh, find out more information about that. Then we go into the actual roles. So we start with the president, vice president, or um, if, for, if it's for the council meetings, we go into the chair and the vice chair, and then the secretary. So we go over the roles of the president. And again, this can be uh, customized to the meeting you're presenting it to. So our advisory board meeting has a president. Our council meetings have a chair. There is no president for the council meetings. And then the chairs attend the advisory board meeting. So if I was presenting this to the council meetings, I wouldn't use the terms president and vice president. I would use the terms chair and vice chair. And we go over the roles of both of those positions. And we go over the roles of secretary. Then we go over the other two roles of treasurer and sergeant at arms. So for our group, we do collect dues. Um, it's voluntary based on the meeting. The amount is again based on the meeting. It's all voted for by the members. So they vote when they pay their dues, um, how much they pay, what you do with the dues. That's all voted on by the group. So because we do collect dues, we have a treasurer. And then we have a sergeant at arms, uh, just someone to keep the meeting in order, make sure conversations aren't getting out of control, that we're focused on the agenda. They start and they end the meeting. Um, and then for our meetings, we do have gavels that we bring that the sergeant at arm, sergeant arms uses. I've seen meetings where people use bells. Uh, I've seen meetings where uh, the sergeant at arms claps, and that's how they get the attention of people. You just want it to be a sort of uh, break, something that's going to break up a conversation, something that's not typical. Um, and we're not fans of yelling. Uh, that's, you know, something that we try to teach with respectful behavior. Um, so we don't want people to just start yelling in a meeting. So we chose the gavel. It works very well for us, but do what works well for your meeting. And then that's it. So that is just basically a run through of what we do for our officer trainings. And then like Ashley said, just to reiterate, the role of the advisor is a background role. It's not our meeting, it's the group's meeting. There will come a time when you don't necessarily agree with the group. For example, as one of my councils, one of the councils that I advise wanted to print magnets as a fundraiser. We had done that in the past and had lost hundreds of dollars. I gently reminded everybody what happened as a lot of the members were new and not there at the time. I gave them all of the options that they had come up with at previous meetings and they decided on a different fundraiser that actually didn't cost us anything to do and it was all profit. If they had still wanted to print the magnets to sell, then I, you know, I would have arranged that because it's their money that they're using. It's the dues that they collected. Um, but alter offering an alternate to the group helps ensure that everyone has the most updated information and choices in front of them and the supports that they have to make the best decisions for them. Uh, sometimes this means printing in terms of pr printing items in large print. 
uh, going over the agenda ahead of time and answering any questions with the officers so they're aware of the topics, helping with transportation by sending emails to certain staff or family members, using gentle reminders or prompts to help people initiate conversations or discussions. And then with Zoom, it's fantastic because you have the ability to send private messages, to send reminders like, hey, did you want to add something about that? Or guiding their attention to a member who has their hand up. And planning ahead uh, is uh, part of organization that's really gonna help you have a successful group that can be maintained. So it's really important to um, have backup plans, right? We are not the sole person. If we're not able to make the meeting, it shouldn't be canceled just because of us. It's not our meeting, remember, it's the group's meeting. So we should be um, able to have everything ready to go so someone else can take over. Our program uses a lot of shared drives. We love them. Fantastic for transparency, sharing resources and information, and letting other people know what's going on in the meetings. Specifically, we love using Keynote, which is a free program from Google, Google Drive. We love that. Um, we use a shared calendar as well. There's full transparency between all members in our group. So that way, if I have an emergency, if my car breaks down, you know, the meeting doesn't have to be canceled on that account. Someone else can step in and they know exactly what's going on. They know the agenda. Um, and then same thing with our trainings. If we're doing a training or if someone's supposed to be doing a training to your your group, having presenter notes ready can easily help someone else step in and take over that role in the you know, instance that maybe they can't make it. Email blind copy, email BCC is uh, such an important tool as an advisor. First of all, we only use email uh, blind copies for our reminders. One, I don't have consent to give out everybody's email information and a lot of people use a personal email, not their work email. They might only have a personal email. So I don't have consent to just send that to everybody. And when you put that just in the to portion of an email, everybody can see everybody's information, their emails. So we like to use the BCC so that way you uh, are only getting the email. You don't know who else is on the email, so you don't see other people's personal information. Then also it's really nice because sometimes people like to reply all automatically. And that way, if you're just sending out a reminder about an email, everybody's not getting that. I'll be there email in response. So only you are. And then it's just a great way to keep other people in the loop as well. Um, sometimes I'll BCC Ashley if we're doing a, um, we're sharing responsibilities for a council meeting just to let her know, hey, this person's been contacted. Or if I'm sending out a reminder, I'll BCC Ashley as well to let her know, hey, I'm sending out the reminder, the reminder's already gone out. Vacation responder, again, super important. If you're telling people you're gonna respond during working hours and then you take a vacation, they're going to wonder why you're not responding. Setting up a vacation responder is a good way to let people know who they can contact if they need someone else. Just remember to let that other person know. So if I'm gonna put Ashley in my email uh, as someone that someone can contact while I'm out, I wanna give Ashley that heads up so that she can be prepared, she can go through our notes, she can go through the share drive and be aware of what might be needed of her. Advanced planning, again, people need time to plan for transportation or support staff and it's uh, super important. If uh, something happens like weather or the location we normally have our meetings at is gonna be closed, I would contact the chair or the president, depending on which position they have in the meeting, and ask them what they wanna do. Do they wanna cancel? Do they wanna reschedule? And then as soon as I know that answer, I'm going to let everybody know to give them as much time as possible. And then you just wanna be easily repeatable. Again, just because I can't go to a meeting doesn't mean the meeting shouldn't run. Uh, I want things to be accessible for everyone, and that's just gonna help the meetings run smoother. So we are uh, big, big fans of sharing everything in Google Drive. We have folders set up where we put all of our information, our agendas, 
our uh, attendance sheets, our receipts, anything. Uh, this was super helpful if you are especially taking long periods of time off. Something might come up if someone has to cover your meeting. Everything is there, everything is shared, and it's updated in real time. So that's really important and uh, just fantastic. We use it all the time. We do also have this in our handout section of planning and communication for group homes to help you uh, learn how to uh, get more contacts and how important it is to give people that notice. That is in your handout section and you can uh, take that with you. Okay, so now we're going to check out uh, a template that can really be used to keep our context list up to date. It doesn't have to be super fancy, you just want it to be functional. So you need the following information. You need a name and uh, contact information for every staff member or member involved in the group. This is going to help you with uh, when contingency you know, this is part of contingency planning. You wanna make sure that you can call the entire group or email the entire group quickly and let them know if you have to cancel a meeting due to something out of your control. You never want folks to show up for a planned meeting and find that the meeting was canceled, that no one's there. We know how busy everybody is. We know how much uh, DSPs are strapped for time. Um, so we want to be respectful of that. And if you do have to cancel a meeting, again, advance notice, as much advance notice as possible is what you want to do. So name the agency that the person is affiliated with, an address, a physical address is sometimes helpful to have. Um, they could also just note, you know, Park Avenue group home with this agency, whatever helps you to identify um, where that person is coming from. I always try to get at least one email address, if not two, for the house. Um, sometimes group homes will split the emails between the direct staff and then managers. And I, uh, what, however they're doing it, you wanna make sure that you have that contact information. So this is part of every single meeting that we have. We don't you know, wait until something happens before we ask for updates. This will physically be passed around the room at in-person meetings, so pre-COVID meetings, and we will continue to do that when we are back meeting in person as well. Um, nowadays, uh, email kickbacks help us identify who we need to contact and update. So if I get a return undeliverable message, message I know that I can call the agency or you know, hit up another contact there and make sure that I have the uh, replacement or see where they're at with finding uh, someone to fill that spot. So we have uh, a little bit of information about starting a group because I know there are new advisors here, which is so exciting. So I always say the first place to start is, uh, you know, what kind of group do you want to be? Do you want to be a true advocacy group? Or are you going to focus on policy and legislative advocacy? and really pay attention to bills that are moving through the legislature that affect people with disabilities? Or do you also uh, want to be a systems advocacy group? Do you want to really interface with decision makers at DHS and DDD and the different programs that the state maintains to serve people with disabilities? Do you want to be kind of an eclectic group, a combination group that's going to work on community awareness and education? through trainings at schools um, and information like that? Or do you want to be more of a skill building group where you're going to invite experts in the field to come in and discuss different items? Again, the answer to this question should be based on the needs and interest and drive of the members. So you may be surprised how your group evolves over time, but that's the cool part of working with groups. Um, and again, the more that the members are interested in a particular topic, that's where you're going to see things happen. It shouldn't be like pulling teeth. It shouldn't be pushing people to get involved and stay engaged. If people are passionate, that's going to be a natural part of the group's evolution. So a lot of this we 
uh, did go over, but it's just so important. Reminders, reminders, reminders. No less than four a month can really help people feel comfortable with the premise and the schedule of your meeting. Following up, making sure that the guest speakers uh, confirmed that they are in fact going to be at the meeting or making sure that everybody has the uh, uh, promotional material or the items that they need for the meeting. And following through, be reliable. Do what you say you're gonna do and make sure that it's timely. If you show that you're uninterested in the meeting, then everyone else is going to feel that. We wanna be consistent. Same meeting, same times, you know, fourth week of the month on a Tuesday can really help uh, the membership of your group stay the same or grow. Relevance, just like Ashley just said, uh, members are going to be more interested in going when the topics apply to them. So just reiterating the goals of the group should reflect the goals of the members. And then food or refreshments. People will go to the ends of the earth for free food. But uh, we just want to let you know from our experience, uh, try not to have food during the meeting. It's gonna be hard for people to focus. And if you're gonna have food after the meeting, don't let it sit out because it's really, again, hard to focus if you're smelling pizza that you can't eat. It's where your mind's going. Everyone's starting to get really hungry. That's just what's worked really the best for us. That is a great point, Erin. That's a very visceral example. We're all smelling pizza now. Um, just to build on that a little bit, you know, advocacy groups are built for advocacy. So it's not a pizza party every month. It's not an ice cream social, um, you know, and we really have to be careful about how we're framing our group. If we're only getting people in the door, and I've seen this in real life, um, if we're only getting people in the door because they are, you know, getting food, it's you're going to feel that there's not as much of a push to make things happen. There's not as much uh, motivation to participate in advocacy campaigns. So, you know, if it's a social group, that's fine. That's great. There's a place for that. And that might be the place where you're going to have a pizza party instead of an advocacy meeting. Um, so again, it's about that shared vision. It's about what do the members want to work on together? And it's asking that question and continuing to ask that question over time. Groups evolve, members change, you know, new advisors might step in. So change is a natural part of this process and checking in every so often and saying, okay, listen, three months ago, we were focusing on this. Is this still important to us? Yes, no, maybe what's coming up for us now. I'll also say that over time, you know, the issues evolve. So there may be a piece of legislation that passes that addresses one of our concerns, or maybe um, an issue that you know was affecting us negatively. You know, a new leadership took over, and the program's now doing better. It's really about staying on top of what's happening. And just a plug for you know being involved in our network, we will send out pertinent advocacy alerts and action alerts. So you know we try to make it as easy as possible we meaning the New Jersey Self-Advocacy Project and the ARC of New Jersey, we want advocates to be able to get involved and speak out in a very streamlined, efficient way. So please join our list so you can bring that information to the groups that you work with. Um, again, accountability. Your expectations um, of the group, you know, we, we hopefully we go in with a fully person-centered, strengths-based perspective. I want to believe that of every person working in the field today. If you know, if that's not the case, or you're not seeing that, we just have to really step back and recognize that maybe your version of success isn't the group's version of success, and that's okay. Maybe the things that you feel strongly about aren't reflected in the group that you're helping to advise and support. That's okay. Again, it should really be focused on what the members want to do. What is their mission? What brings them back to the table every month or every, you know, when, whenever you guys are meeting? And, you know, this happens every so often. We get a big win. We're excited that the budget reflects the needs of people with disabilities. Celebrate those successes. Those things don't happen without work. Those things don't happen without advocacy. So anytime you can step back as a group and say, wow, we really, you know, helped 
the governor realized DSPs need a wage increase. It's in the budget. We're seeing it. We just have to keep fighting and making sure it stays in place. It's okay to, you know, remark on those things. It will help motivate us over the long term. So we have a few case examples. We realize it is after three o'clock. We really appreciate you staying with us. Um, this is you know, the end of our presentation, we just have a few questions we want to ask you. We have uh, some things that have happened during our, like Ashley said, plus two decades of experience. Uh, so here's uh, the first case examples. The first case example, you receive phone calls from an advocate at all hours of the night. They claim it is an emergency, but when you talk to them, they're asking you to do things that aren't in your job description, things that you can't do, or they just want to talk, or um, you know, they don't even really tell you what is going on. So as a group advisor, how could you handle this? How would you handle this? If you could type in the questions box, what you think you would do as an advisor Sometimes this happens um, if we don't express our boundaries for work hours, we could get phone calls. Even if we do express our boundaries, we could get phone calls outside of those hours on the weekends at 2 a.m. So uh, if you wanna type in the questions box, what do you think you would do in this situation? Yeah, we'd really love to hear from you. Um, you know, we're not trying to call anyone out here. <laughs> we'll say that these examples are based on uh, some shared experiences. These things happen, right? And I think that we're looking at an example that whether you're a DSP or, you know, someone supporting folks with disabilities in another sense, uh, this may come up. So we're really curious, how would you deal with this? a bit of a boundary cross I'd say so any thoughts that you have on what might be an appropriate response as a group advisor we'd love to hear from you guys so I'm not seeing anything in the questions but I just want to um let you know that this is why it's important and this goes for any aspect of your life. Oh, I do see Maria, you said reinforce boundaries, explaining the times that I'm available, the topics that are considered emergencies. Perfect, yes, that's fantastic. Um, that's exactly what I would advise as well. Um, you also maybe don't wanna give out your personal information. So our program we have a uh, you know a program that gives everybody extensions i can then forward those phone calls to my cell phone i don't have to give out my personal cell phone information which can really help cut down on anyone trying to reach me outside of my work hours uh, it's also why vacation reminders are so important because if you're on vacation and you're not working if someone does have an emergency or, or they do need help with something, they know who else they can contact as well. Absolutely, it's so important to maintain those boundaries. As an advisor, as a staff member, you have the right to take a vacation. It's You should not feel guilty for not returning a phone call at that time. And Paul, Paul's shared that, ask when they are available to discuss with staff and reminds folks that there is a time and place for everything while still remaining supportive and understanding. I'll say Paul does that amazingly well. Um, I know that for a fact, and that's it. You know, you, you should not step in and try to be the hero every time. People will benefit from knowing that, again, there is a time and place to discuss different issues. And midnight on Sunday, not the time, not the time. We have to maintain those professional boundaries. Excellent. So here's case example number two. So let's imagine that you are scheduled to do a workshop at a location in the community. The location assures you that they will provide all of the materials you need for your presentation on self-advocacy. They're gonna give you a projector, extension, cord screen, all of that. 
they even offer to make copies of your presentation for you. What do you do? As a group advisor, what would we do? Any thoughts on this? Oh, Maria, yes. So Maria said, I would allow them to provide assistance, but bring the equipment and materials just in case. Absolutely. You know, like we were talking about before, contingency planning. We appreciate the support. We appreciate the interest in the topic, self-advocacy, our area of expertise, but we're not going to put all our eggs in one basket, so to speak, and just assume that they will have those materials ready. Um, so like Maria said, having the information that you need and the materials you need to do the presentation you agreed to do is critical. Um, Aaron and I both have a stash of supplies in our trunk at all times. So if someone didn't have the extension cord, no problem. I'm going to run out and grab mine. Um, another thing to keep in mind is you never quite know what the location is going to look like. So we've trained in very, very tiny office spaces. We've trained in living rooms and dining rooms. We've trained in huge workshops and warehouses. So having that extension cord that's, you know, uh, not maybe not your typical size, a nice long one that can run across the whole workshop is important too. It's just kind of thinking of all the ways that um, you might hit a snafu and then being able to, to plan for those in advance. I would also say that um, you know you want to get an alternate contact for this agency because you may be working with someone at the agency, the location that um, turnover is real. They may have lost their job by that point. They may have moved on. So don't just show up on the date that you agree to. You need to confirm, contact them in advance, and hopefully have another alternate contact there just in case maybe that person, the original person's out for the day or needed to take time off. You're not just kind of left in the lurch um, without a contact. Excellent. So case example number three, the, the group that you advise would like to testify in favor of a bill that your organization opposes. What would you do when the member's goals conflict with your agency's goals? And hopefully this doesn't happen. Hopefully everybody is always on the same page, but it's it's good to know uh, there, you know, is going there are going to be some people who maybe don't agree with the group as a whole. Um, how would you handle that situation? I wanna thank you guys again so much for sticking with us and participating in these case examples. We so appreciate the flexibility on this. Um, you know, this is something we could probably talk about all day long, <laughs> but we do appreciate you sticking around. Oh, okay, so we've, we've stumped yeah. some folks. Erin, how would we handle this? So, um, I like Maria, you did offer up um, having an open discussion to better understand their perspectives. I love that. I love open discussions. I love getting to learn about why people feel certain ways. Uh, it helps me grow as a person as well. Um, and then Paul, again, create a forum where both advocates and admins are present. So yeah, so this, this has happened um, in a few meetings that I've attended. Uh, what I've done personally is if someone has a goal that doesn't align with maybe the organization or the group as a whole, we could work on doing an individual testimony that isn't um, presented on letterhead by the organization or by the group, but instead it comes from that individual advocate and they can say their name, um, the county where they're a resident at, and then uh, also giving everybody the information to do that on their own as well. So if they wanted to testify on a um, something that you know we can't 
support or maybe everybody doesn't agree with. Again, everybody can write individual testimonies um, coming from themselves, coming from their own personal address, and then we can work on it in the meeting so everybody can have that support that an advisor would offer, but still have it come individually from the person instead of the group as a whole. Excellent, that one was a little tough. Yeah, that was great ideas. It's really our role as part of that is bridging the gap. We can bring those two groups together and try to reach some common ground. Okay, so case example number four, our fourth, and this is our final one, I believe. Um, so let's imagine that as an advisor, you've reached out to the chairperson or the president of the self-advocacy group you advised a few times now. They, uh, You've asked them to review the agenda and finalize talking points before the meeting next week because you have to send that out with the reminders, right? After your fourth unreturned email, the chairperson responds with, okay, looks good. You know, based on your training, that the chairperson should be participating more in agenda development. What do you do? What do you do? We have some ideas that we'd love to share, but we would also love to hear from folks, you know, have you experienced this before? How do you address it? It could be kind of a tricky spot to be in as an advisor. Yeah, so having a discussion with the chairperson, reviewing the duties they agreed to, and ask what barriers are in place that are keeping them from being more involved. I love that, Maria, you're hitting on, you know, the expectations reiterating what they literally signed up for. It's typically an election, they are an elected official of a group, and they agree to do certain things, including being an active participant in agenda development. And yeah, exploring like what's holding you back? You know, maybe, how about this? Maybe email's not their preferred method of communication, right? Um, we don't read minds for better or worse. So we want to make sure we're understanding what their process is oh it looks like the slides uh just there we go um so we understand you know often people are not paid for their positions within a self-advocacy group so they may have a lot of other things going on maybe it's best to jump on a phone call with them on their preferred date and a preferred time um but again it is our role as an advisor to express you have good ideas you signed up to be an active role in the group, a leader in the group, and that you really need that support. So um, yeah, I just here wanna plug, we do these types of training and workshops. So we can help you as an advisor um, express those expectations and the roles and responsibilities of each group position and leadership position. So. If you're new to this, if you want the folks that you're supporting to get that information, we would love to do that. That is a service that we offer um, free of charge to agencies who support folks with disabilities statewide. So, uh, excellent. We have some information about our program in the handouts tab. Um, if there's any questions, we would love to hear them. Again, thank you guys so much for uh, being here with us and for going through. It's a lot of information. Um, like Ashley said, we could talk about this all day. Um, but if you have any questions about anything that um, you would like to discuss um, and you don't want to put them in the questions box, you can always reach out to us and uh, we can help you on the side. And like Ashley said, we do trainings on a variety of topics as well. So if you would like us to come in and help with anything, please reach out to us and let us know. Absolutely, I, I just wanna second that. Uh, we are here to support self-advocacy. So we're here to support advisors as well as members. And um, we split up the handouts that are on the GoToWebinar control panel into three different areas. So we have general NJSAP, New Jersey Self-Advocacy Project Resources, that's the label there. But we also have a group of handouts titled For Your Group. So this is again, functional information that we hope will help you 
as an advisor, but also help the officers of your group understand what their roles are. So um, they're all attached as a PDF. And then of course, the full slide set that we discussed today and presented today is attached as well. So yeah, we so appreciate you guys for being here. Thank you so much for all the fantastic feedback and for sticking around. Um, so thank you. We hope you'll be back again next Tuesday for our next Stay Healthy at Home webinar session.